Dr Vicky Avery and I'm the Keeper of the Applied Arts Department here at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And what we have before us here is a fantastic, unique clay model by the great French Rococo sculptor Louis-Francois Rubiliac of the German composer uh, George Frederick Handel. And it shows the great man in the middle of composing. The work, we know, was commissioned by a chap called Jonathan Tyers, who was a businessman, an entrepreneur, a great patron of the arts in uh, early 18th century England. And this is the presentation model. Uh, it would be modelled in clay and then fired in a kiln to make it hard and durable to show to the patron. Now, at the time that Rubiliac made the sculpture, he wasn't very well known. He didn't have a large studio. We know that he worked out of uh, Peter's Court in St Martin's Lane. He therefore would have modelled this entirely by himself. Uh, and we know that the patron was insistent on it being carved from a single block of Carrara marble. Apparently, it was the largest block of Carrara marble then available in the UK. The model is typical of what we know from documents uh, about Rubiliac's working procedures. He probably, in fact, would have made two or three of these models, uh, but only this one actually survives, which is why it's so important and so unique. It's very, very highly finished. Uh, you can see um, that the uh, terracotta has been, as it were, smoothed over prior to casting. You can see tool marks on some of the drapery. And if you look very closely, you can see the intricate details. You can see the veins on Handel's hand. You can see the turn of the manuscript page that the young uh, boy is writing on. Every detail has been worked into this model. The buttons on the clothing, the strings of the lyre, even the toenails on the feet of the putto. We're here in the Founders Library at the Fitzwilliam Museum uh, with Dr Suzanne Reynolds, who's the assistant keeper of the Manuscripts and Printed Book Collection. Suzanne, please tell us something about the library. Well, this is called the Founders Library because it holds the um, bequest of printed books and other material made by Viscount Fitzwilliam himself, founder of the museum. Hmm. And we've got one here um, dating from exactly the period that your terracotta was yes. produced. So it's, I can see here it says, Alexander's Feast, an ode. The words by Mr. John Dryden, the great poet, Absolutely. set to music by Mr. George Frederick Handel, anno 1736. Mm. So that's fascinating because this is being composed just the year before uh, this was commissioned mm. by Jonathan Tyers for... Uh, sort of gardens. gardens, but this is so fascinating because this absolutely relates. We know from the finished marble mm. that one of the books on which he's leaning is Alexander's Feast. Oh. Here we are, the second part. And look, it says, Now strike the golden lyre again. So, this is uh, the musician Timotheus playing to Alexander the Great, and actually, here we have Handel playing the lyre. Mm. But look here, we have all the instruments who are supposed to be playing at this part. Yeah. And look, it says here, this is an oboe, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, an oboe, yeah. An oboe, and actually we have the oboe in the sculpture. Right. And look, violoncelli. Yeah. And this oh, is what... They're there as well. Right. They're in the sculpture. So okay. actually, this musical text and the score seems to relate absolutely to this three-dimensional public sculpture. So a real recognition, I think, of Handel's genius at this very precise moment, moment in London in, in his London career. Yeah, yeah fascinating. In the Fitzwilliam, we have this wonderful gold ring, and you can see on the bezel of the ring a beautiful enamel portrait of Handel. It's a copy after a Hudson portrait, and it's much, much more formal. This is how uh, Handel would have been seen in public, with his wig on and with his outdoor clothes, much, much more formal, much more static. This is informal Handel, at home, with no wig, with his uh, day cap on his head, just about to stand up, nothing formal about him. So what's so unique about this Rubiliac uh, uh, 
vision of Handel is the great informality and yet it was going to be a life-size public monument. This was completely unknown. What the British public were used to seeing in terms of public outdoor marble sculpture was their monarch, great military heroes or noblemen. Handel was not English, he was German, he was a commoner and to be shown as life-size, full-scale, uh, in informal dress in a public setting was completely revolutionary. And it was this image of Handel, not this image of Handel, which became the prototype, the standard iconography of Handel ever since. It was a great, great success.